This is not a problem unique to EU4, or even indeed Paradox games. The conclusions of games, especially in their later stages, can certainly suck. Some suck more than others. Some hit literally unplayable states. And, well, others actually get some pretty good late game solutions. Now, EU4 is my game of choice for this discussion, as it is the game I'm most comfortable with, and also the game I most frequently play, to both the earlier game and the later game extent. But with that said, I'm going to want to go over some other games and identify some issues with them as well, because while the overall problems can seem similar, I believe it can manifest itself in different ways depending on the game, and the genre, and the general approach taken by the developers, as well as the time period. And we can learn from other games what works well and what doesn't. So before we begin and open up our game of choice, let's get the classic things out of the way. A like of the video would be appreciated if you haven't already, and a subscription would be amazing. We're awfully close to 16k subs, so let's go get it. Anyway, enough self-shitting, today we begin with Hearts of Iron 4. I won't claim to have anyone near as extensive experience in this game as I have in EU4, but I played my fair share, and late game here sucks. AI post-1945 can pop out stupid division counts, making attacking less a, where do I tactically use my tanks and create breach heads, and more, how can I overcome this wall of 500k men on every tile? The same is then repeated for naval and air combat. What's the point of nuance if the solution is to drop the equivalent of the total cost of all Paradox games on a plane budget, pop out like 10,000 fighters, bombers and naval bombers, and use that to try and make a dent in the AI's version of the same stacking. Which also includes stupid plane counts, since again, past 1945, the AI has 10k planes out on their own. As a classic problem for Paradox games too, late game the micro necessary to function also gets really problematic. You just need to keep doing so many things at the same time. This has somewhat been addressed with more recent versions of the game, with for example garrisons no longer being shove 72 cavalry divisions with a military police support company under a general, and keep doing that until you cover every tile, uh, and has been relegated into a tab that you just throw manpower infantry equipment into, and then achieve pretty much the same thing. Another classic problem encountered here, which is not frequently addressed, is that when you hit the I have now one stage, usually you're far from actually having won. You need to go and grind out that win against the AI. That said though, this problem mostly applies if you're trying to do things like a world conquest, or even say, as Germany, are trying to invade the USA in 1946, after taking out both the UK and the Soviet Union. If you play as, for example, the UK and just defeat Germany, you tend to avoid a lot of these problems. You still encounter some of the late game scaling by significantly being able to increase your production capabilities by the late game, but it's nothing stupid. And even then, those increases are usually useful for achieving the victory, instead of being complete overkill. Overall, I will give Hoi 4 remarkably enough a pass, if played as intended, let's be honest, the game kind of ends before you run into those issues. And if you played past the intended endpoint of the game, the defeat of Germany, you will encounter issues, but I like to attribute that to being more of a post-planned experience issue. Namely, you play past the end date, and the game isn't planning on you doing that. I actually struggled on finding a way to communicate this concept, but the best thing I could think of was, imagine a company made a device for peeling oranges. Now, this device was optimized for peeling oranges, but people soon realized it could also be used to peel potatoes. It functioned while peeling potatoes, but obviously it was designed for peeling oranges. Now, a bunch of people who bought it had no intention of peeling oranges, and then only wanted to use it to peel potatoes. And then they went ahead and reviewed the product badly, because it had some features that made no sense for potato peeling, because they were made for peeling oranges. And this is kind of what I feel like with Hearts of Iron 4. It really struggles with the late game, but you're not meant to really go to 1948. It would be great if it could be improved, that's for sure, but I'd rather the focus of the game itself remain on improving the core gameplay loop and the features of that, namely the nation building and mobilizations of those nations, instead of worrying about the fact that in 1949 the USA can deploy 3 million tanks into India trying to stop the Germans advancing into Bengal. With that, I think the best conclusion from Hoi 4 is, end your game at a reasonable time. Don't overstay your welcome, and be careful with numerical buffs. Too much plus 10% production things stacked can make Ireland pop out like 200 heavy tanks a day. Now, let's talk about Stellaris. Now, Stellaris I've played maybe honestly a touch too extensively, I'm at the point with this game that I actually look forward to the late game and basically rush the tech so I can actually start playing the game, quote unquote. Early game Slurus for me is insanely tedious. It involves the same actions of exploring and discovering alien artifacts and event chains that I have seen hundreds of times before. Meaning in many cases, it feels like instead of playing a game, I'm rereading a novel and I'm being tested if I remember the correct event input I need to select to ensure I get the best buff from it. The same criteria can be technically applied to Crusader Kings 2, but I guess it's Crusader Kings 2 and their long event chains the nice thing is, is that if I don't want my character to prove that the Earth goes around the Sun for the 50th campaign, I can just not take the scholarship focus. While in Stellaris, regardless of what campaign you're doing, exploration is pretty much universal. You're going to have to send out your science ship to scout planets, you're going to have to colonize a couple more planets, let them expand, and so on and so forth, regardless of what kind of game you're doing. 
With that said, we will get into Crusader Kings 2, and this repetition is naturally a property of accessory play in the game, any game, but I mention it because it means I do genuinely look forward to the late game. Now in the early game you don't have the capacity to specialise planets to a stupid extent, but in the late game a consumer goods shortage for example is best addressed by making a planet that is specialised in nothing else but making consumer goods, or growing food, or producing trade. Overall, this means that, to me, Stellaris actually picks up in the end of the vanilla tech tree, where you can finally play the game in this way, you can finally optimize your planets and make your super functional, very nice empire, at which point the game is over and you have won. Not in the practical sense, you don't have the victory screen, we'll get to that in a bit, but in the sense of removing all challenge. The AI naturally does not specialize in this fashion at all, and actually the difficulty on higher AI, well, difficulties such as Grand Admiral, boils down to survive until I can outscale AI incompetence. For this reason, I actually really enjoyed the Gigastructures mod for Stellaris, which basically expanded the end of the vanilla tech tree with a whole bunch of technologies for building reality-defining objects in some kind of over-the-top anti-physics common sense zeal. Think the stupidity of Middle East mega projects, but in space and with budgets large enough that the projects actually become a reality. Like, yes, building a ring world is already the cosmic equivalent of an oil money flex, but how about four ring worlds? Now, wouldn't the ring behind the first one get exactly zero sunlight? No worries, make that into an Alderson disc, since clearly we can just do that. I mean, issues such as common sense and how was the structure not internally collapsing immediately are just obstacles that need to be overcome by throwing enough energy, alloys, and engineers at the problem. The thing that I like about Gigastructures too is that it does also give you things to, well, use your super projects for. Yes, a big space computer is really good at producing science, and for all practical purposes, it's able to mine Bitcoin in big O to the minus one time, but that science isn't wasted doing future tech three times a turn. There is actual late game technologies and technological challenges that can be met using the scientific output. This mention of late game challenges actually takes us back to vanilla. Where I have to give credit to the developers, they tried. Late game crises do present an existential threat to the galaxy. And since the player is a member of said galaxy, also to the player. The issue with them in my experience is the combat overall in Stellaris for the most part boils down to bigger number wins. This means that with these crises, you either lose to the crisis because its number is bigger, or you happen to have a larger number. Or you also go on the Wikipedia, go by the shit components used by the crisis, and counter the specific crisis built by picking the rock, since you know that the crisis already committed 104% of its resources to scissors. I find overall it's not really a fun challenge, more of a, does your country meet a X fleet strength checklist? Almost like taking an exam. You need 50k fleet power to pass, whether you have 51k or 500k, the result is much the same, and plays out much the same way. And after fighting the crises a couple times, they don't really provide a unique enough reason to play it again from a personal experience. Now, you may be wondering why I praise the modern endgame challenges, but in truth, it's simply because they were new to me and hence different. Even core unique bosses like the Blobcats boil down to make enough science thing and alloy thing to solve science puzzle so you can take down their plot armor shield and stab them with big space strength number. But to get back to Stellaris proper, the late game of Stellaris can definitely suffer from a you have now just won, prove it to the rest of the universe challenge. Although here we also reach a new problem, game optimization. Dear Lord Alive, Stellaris overall has had a couple total system overhauls, ranging from how planets work to FTL or faster than light travel methods to overhauls of their Civ 5 policy knockoff mechanics from Utopia. This has come in tandem with performance improvements and even performance overhauls. Overall, the improvement to performance has been massive, but that's not because the current Stellaris now runs like Doom on my pregnancy test. The improvements are massive because current Stellaris is leagues ahead of the insanely laggy mess a lot of its previous versions were. We're talking about situations where a new job would be created on a backwater mining planet with troops and habitability, orbiting a black hole and a quasar simultaneously, somehow at the same time, and every single population in the galaxy that had a migration treaty or was within the empire of the nation that created this job, you know, ranging from science directors on guy worlds to pampered pops living unemployed carefree lives under utopian abundance, all of these populations are immediately going to go, oh, do I want a career mining copper in central Greenland? After reaching the inevitable no conclusion, they then went on with their day, after taking up your processor of course, until they were all rudely interrupted yet again by an exciting new opportunity to pursue a career in agriculture in central Tibet, offering competitive wages and unlimited PTO. Now I can spend a concerning amount of time talking about Stellaris performance, but the Stellaris section is already getting extensively larger than it should be, so I'll leave it here. But the physical limitation of it takes three real life days to process one in-game day is a very real one, and one that Stellaris certainly suffers from on top of a lack of real unique endgame content. And no, don't go telling me that a ring world is unique endgame content. 
I can right now in vanilla start literally on a ring world day one without unforcing. And finally, to repeat myself from earlier, no real challenges are present in the end game. Even if they try with the old crisis system and the new galactic council emperorship or even the Khan for like a mid game crisis, or even become special crisis sentient books. There are cool little mini things you can do to tick them off, but once you've done them once, there's very little replayability in that sense. Stellaris to me at the moment plays like a game where I put up with the early game sadness to get to that sweet end game and just find an empty room when I get there. Which to me is a shame, I genuinely do very much like the game, but I guess it's more of a property of playing Stellaris too much almost where I have just finished it. Now, I want to address a weird one now, Crusader Kings 2. To be clear, I'm not talking about 3 since my experience with 3 is very limited compared to 2, although to be clear, I'm working on fixing that, but I have to say that Crusader Kings 2 is a very unusual one when it comes to late game challenge and late game gaming in particular, because it doesn't really change, as it were, by the time you get later into the game. If you start on the earliest date, even by the 12th century, which I frequently reached, although not really any further since by that point my goals have were pretty much achieved. The gameplay for a feudal state with Legalism 3, which means that you can have access to Primogeniture. To take a very brief little gap now, uh, if you don't have Primogeniture, when you die your land is split up in some fashion between your kids, instead of your heir or player character getting everything. Meaning that if you owned, for example, England and Wales, Wales would gain independence without Primogeniture. So with that little credit out of the way, within Crusader Kings 2, it kind of plays the same whether you're in a 900 AD or 1200 AD, that's not to say there's no progression, but the progression for me, for the most part, is towards that of a feudal realm, which once reached, well, isn't that impacted by technological developments. Technology isn't global, it's on a province level, meaning that even if you take your capital to the moon, it would take a while for those buffs to diffuse. And that is another thing. In many games, more technologies means new boats, new tanks and planes for Hoi 4, for example. For EU4, you gain everything from new buildings to new castles belly that really change the way you play the game to entire game concepts like admin efficiency being locked behind technologies. The ability to build new unit types like cannons but get unlocked within tech. While for Crusader Kings 2, outside of Legalism 3 enable primogeniture, or even maybe Majesty 5 if you want to play with vice royalties, hint you don't, the techs for the most part either do things like gain 10% prestige instead of 5%, or plus 5% heavy infantry stats. Now bear in mind, not global heavy infantry buffs, but the province where the tech is taken the heavy infantry that come from that province get a 5% buff. Another example of this is actually going to be economic tech, where you'd think increasing that so you can build a better building will be quite impactful. But if you unlock a, for example, military innovation economic tech, so you can upgrade your castle holdings, that means you can now upgrade your barracks to 3 instead of barracks 2 which means that your Barracks 3 is now giving you 50 heavy infantry instead of 30 in your levy. What I mean to say is that technology in Crusader Kings 2 is important, it provides you buffs, but it doesn't change the way you play the game, not really. You can save up technology and get 20 more heavy troops, or you could go and take over your neighbor's land, shove a lot of vassal in there, and when you go to war, raise his vassal troops, which are probably going to be more than 20 heavy troops. But you know, these are functioning the same in terms of you're stronger now. Of course, there are nuances on how you play the game in practice, and how you need to keep your vassals loyal while country troop speed implicitly always loyal to you helps, and so on and so forth. But overall, if you load into 1066 compared to the first date of 769, the overall effect is you see less reformed faiths like Christianity, so more pagans, and you see more tribal provinces that reform into feudal eventually anyway. You see more hordes that haven't settled yet, and that's about it really. And the other main thing is, in other games, AIs tend to consolidate and grow stronger by the late game. But in Crusader Kings 2, since vassal management and realm management is a big part of the game, and the AI does unironically roleplay the game in the sense that good rulers tend to hold their empires together and even expand them, while bad rulers tend to run into issues. Well, you find that in practice, it's a coin toss of how well the AI is doing at any point. In 769, there are already massive empires such as the Abbasid Empire and the Franks about to unite under Charlemagne. And in practice, I've seen, for example, the Abbasids do everything from collapse into 50 realms three days after I impose the game, to expand their empire from Bengal in India to Portugal. This also means that they have anywhere from literally zero men while in 15 civil wars on 10 provinces, to wielding 200k men strong vassal armies. Now this isn't to say that the player can't stack fun things to win the game either. For example, with mechanics like bloodlines, artifacts and inheritable traits, you can breed your family to produce children like Mr. Chad over here, who at the ripe old age of zero pops out of the womb as an attractive, strong, genius, left-handed giant child, which means that from the traits alone, he's gaining plus 45 personal combat skill right away. Which of course is made even better because he happens to be descended from a whole bunch of people. And again, you can just snag these. So you can be the descendant of, say, El Cid, Seljuk, Bohemond, Abdul, Saeed, uh, Haralda, Arpad. All of these people you can just claim descendants from. 
and just gain personal combat skill because you're related to them. And uh, there's quite a list of this, and I haven't even started on the Warrior Lodge bloodlines, I'm only talking about the ones that exist in the vanilla game. Basically, assuming that you have gained every single possible bloodline under the sun, and proven that you descend from every single relevant person who's ever lived, ranging from Alexander the Great to Gandhi, from my calculations, you can get an extra, around an extra 200 personal combat skills when you're born, meaning that our baby mentioned earlier at birth is going to have like 250 personal combat skill, unarmed, as a child. For context, a bear, when you fight them in a wrestling match for one of the legends, so just straight up bear boxing, evaluates said bear with a combat skill of 150, meaning that we finally have an answer to the age-old question, would you rather be left alone in the woods with a man or a bear? Pick the bear, the theoretical existence of this child alone puts the odds of survival into the bear's favour. Now, if winning every single conceivable duel as a zero-old child is not your style, the game also includes many fun mechanics. Like from the top of my head, forming the Kingdom of Israel while you are Jewish gives you a bloodline that among other things gives you 20% damage against religious enemies. The issue is, nothing is stopping you creating the kingdom, destroying the title and forming it again, for another new 20% bloodline that stacks. Now it does cost you 300 money per kingdom formed, and if you just burn a bunch of money for it, you can end up with a dynasty that has like 30 of these bloodlines. Meaning that if a member of your dynasty is ever leading troops fighting non-Jews, it's going to deal 600% damage against them. This means that in practice, if your enemies so much as enter the battle, while your troops have been led by a member of your dynasty, they'll immediately politely leave the mortal plane. What I'm trying to say with this tangent is that if you want to break CK2, you can. But when playing it as intended, Crusader Kings 2 honestly avoids the issue of the late game sucking, but not really having an endgame. The AI doesn't blob linearly with time and always provides a varied challenge. Your vassal still poses significant risk to your internal stability throughout the campaign, and technology never makes the game trivial or even very different on its own. So overall, CK2, in my opinion, avoids having an endgame that sucks by not really having an endgame. Although I have to admit that this is also influenced due to the fact that you tend to achieve your goals a bit faster. Unite Britain, or say reform the Roman Empire. Once that is done, it's done, and you move on to your next game. So finally, EU4. Now, EU4 has attempted to entice people into the late game by adding cool things that are gated by the clock, such as coal promises that provide massive economic buffs, which, unless you're playing MP, are useless since usually past 1650, you're making enough money. Or even cool revolutionary mechanics past 1700 that basically no one ever gets to play with, since the new fashion for EU4 is finishing your world conquest by 1600 to avoid dealing with the late game. Now, I enjoy a late game EU4 campaign, more so than the average person, I feel, but scaling and nation building is a very present part of the game. This means that if the AI doesn't scale at all, which it certainly did for some patches, that would mean that someone playing in Northern Italy would become the strongest nation in the by basically just owning said Northern Italy and putting some pennies into their country, building a couple of workshops and temples and calling it a day. The current EU4 AI does scale though, and it even does an okay job of taking over its neighbours compared to previous versions, it's certainly more aggressive. But this means that even for the late game, get ready to enjoy fighting your 300k strong Ottomans every time you want to piece your from. Is this war winnable? Sure, but with the EU4, once you get to something like 1 million men in the field, you can beat the world united against you. But you need to go out and grind out that win, and that just gets boring. Nothing is less enjoyable than fighting a war where you have a better army quality, you outnumber the AI 3 to 1 as you just prove your superiority in a tedious grind fest akin to late game Hoi 4. In terms of features, we actually have a decent chunk of things locked behind the late game, again from coal to revolutionary mechanics to even admin efficiency from the age of absolutism. Although again, if we're considering 1600s to be late game, then I think that's more of a problem with us. But overall, all of these features don't address the main issues. It's like having a child scared of needles, and instead of addressing the fear directly, you just say, oh, um, if you stop being scared of needles, he can have a candy. And when the child says no, because surprise, surprise, they're still scared of the needle, going, well, how about two candies instead? And then being surprised that that strategy doesn't work overall. The issue isn't the quantity of candies, it's the amount of hatred of the needle. And to be clear, making something late game content by making the mission before it need a university in the province or saying you need admin tech X to do this thing doesn't make it real late game content. That's just putting normal content under a time gate for purely gameplay reasons. If you're skilled enough to unify Germany in 30 years, you should be able to form it and not wait 130 years for the people to realize, oh, that's how cathedrals work before they finally let you proclaim Germany. To not be too negative though, I would say EU4 is actually pretty good in that regard. It just fails to overcome the grinding tedium of the post-early game content, wars, and nation building. To get back to a previous video I made where I asked why don't people play big nations, a common thread that I touched upon but was frequently talked about is that big nations you have already won even at game start, while for a small nation that is less true, and you need to prove that you've won. In some sense, beating Byzantium as the Ottomans is less fun than beating the Ottomans as Byzantium, since with the Ottomans, your victory is a foregone conclusion. But with Byzantium, you need to work for your win. 
I was initially planning on dismissing this criticism by stating, the player is the most powerful modifier in the game. Once you load it into E4, that's it, you've already won. But upon reflection, I don't think that's very helpful. At the end of the day, some people are going to find beating France as England challenging. And just because I don't find that challenging doesn't make the war easier for them. Inherently, this boils down to an earlier issue mentioned with Hearts of Iron 4. You can reach a point where you have won and you need to go and prove it to the AI that disagrees, even if you've already know that's won, and that's not very fun. The reason is that it's not fun in my opinion, or at least a big part of it is, is that wars, even if you have overwhelming technology, numbers, naval force limit, brain cell count, or ducats in the bank, you still need to send your armies carefully, not take stupid attrition, not take stupid battles, take good fights against the AI, beat them back methodically, stitch them out, and while doing all of that, you still have to, you know, run the country. Simply put, it's quite a lot of work, and work as a general rule isn't fun. Proving to the late game Ottomans that yes, I beat you up four times already, you are losing a fifth time, while the Ottomans are throwing their stupid troop counts into you, not even reinforcing properly anything, just leading men to the slaughter, or even worse, sneaking past you and starting to carpet siege India, well, it just gets annoying, not helped by the constant whack-a-mole that is rebels in this game. It's a way of modeling internal stability, just not a very good one, because the issue is the most efficient way of dealing with the rebels is just going stab. Overall, my opinion, EU4 suffers from needing too much micro from a really early point. AI that provides not really a fun challenge, but a tedious grindy challenge, and frankly, cool features for the late game, but not anything that makes it worth going that late, or anything that remotely challenges an established nations. Nations are inherently significantly more stable than CK2, and when managed well, internal stability can genuinely disappear as an issue, since your hordes of eternally loyal troops have no issues with constantly uh, negotiating with separatists. Now, for this purpose, I personally find multiplayer solves a lot of these issues, as you end up fighting other players, and things like money and manpower matter past 1650. But that is a separate discussion again, and if you're not a fan of multiplayer, that doesn't help you enjoy EU4 and enjoy its late game. Now here I would like to propose a solution I would personally love as a quality of life feature, and that is the ability to enable AI for a stack. Let me make a stack of troops, and instead of automatic siege or anything of that nature, let me just turn on the AI for like 600k men and let them fight the ultimate 300k. Now if I microed it properly, could I do better? Sure, but at that point I'd prefer the AI to do that for me. Uh, outnumbering the Ottomans 2 to 1 is a foregone conclusion for my win, I'm assuming. And not the sad excuse of automatic sieging, that gets spooked by AI 1k stacks and half morale. No, whatever the AI uses for their actual armies. If you ever grabbed a bunch of big vassals so they could fight the war for you, you've already used this feature to an extent. The code is already there, the AI already moves troops, picks fights, sieges, and even carpet sieges. So let me just do that. Basically have a vassal plus menu I can shove a stack into and go, go siege, or go fight, and even ideally, go fight rebels in India for the next 300 years. Now, I've played a decent chunk of carp U4 with my friends too, and let me tell you, having two people on one nation, where you can basically have one person who does, for example, only fighting, is amazing. You can, as a player, focus on actually running the nation, and then come back to the Ottoman war that finished with new land gained automatically. All you do is scale your income and manpower, and make sure your war person has enough troops and money for these wars as much as possible. On the other hand, if you are the war player cop, you ignore estates, you ignore country management, you ignore rebel management even sometimes. You don't think about any of the things like when is my next tech, or when am I taking my next idea group, or what am I taking from ideas, what's the state of the economy, when are the rebels rising up, all those normally tedious things, and you just go fight the AI. You can focus entirely on it and have fun in that extent, by actually being able to enjoy the wars. If you haven't tried a co-op game, do give it a go, I would greatly recommend. And do remember if you give this a go, whoever is the first to select the nation, is the primary controller, which means they get the event, which also included the estate events. So the person recommended the non-primary controller be your army person, because they're never going to get distracted by a random event where they're trying to fight a battle. Now, does that solve all the problems? No, but I don't want to end on a bad note, and I would personally love this feature, so I'm going to take this as an opportunity to talk about it here. With that said, that is all I have time for today. Thank you very much for watching, with a special thank you to Arkansola. Goodbye.